Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Uh, I'm just going to turn it over to someone you know really well, David Spock, who's going to do a talk today. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is run through a series of oral manifestations cases. And I'll make this open-ended with some questions in a couple places. And so uh, there'll be a little bit different format than we normally do, but the first um, slide here is basically to point out um, or to start the talk in saying that oral manifestations are a really common problem that we see with HIV. And for both primary care clinicians, it's important for the standpoint of being able to recognize HIV. For persons already experienced with HIV, these are common problems that we often have to be able to manage in the clinic on a regular basis. So as I've said, what we're going to have is a series of cases, and let's start off with the first one. This is an individual who presented to the clinic for chronic care for HIV, and his CD4 count was about 360. He presented with these lesions on the side of his tongue, and with the tongue blade, we attempted to scrape these off, and nothing scraped off, and this is what it looked like on the side. And notice sort of the linear striations here. So the first question for you, which is a somewhat of an easy question, but let's see what people say about this. With this individual, which virus is associated with the disorder that I just showed you in this individual's mouth? Would it be A, herpes simplex virus type 2, B, Epstein-Barr virus, C, human herpes virus type 8, or D, human papillomavirus? So we've got a mix here. So we see um, no votes for herpes simplex, which is great because this wasn't herpes. Um, this is oral hairy leukoplakia, and the virus that's associated with oral hairy leukoplakia is Epstein-Barr virus. Human herpes virus type 8 is not associated with these oral hairy leukoplakia lesions. Um, and human papillomavirus is actually, I think, a, an, an interesting choice because these lesions could look like warts, but the characteristic distribution is on the sides of the tongue and with the linear striations. The um, uh, important significance for this is that if you see an individual in your practice and they come in and they have lesions suggestive of oral hair leukoplakia, this does indicate some level of immunosuppression. In the old CDC classification system, we used to give this a category B classification indicating moderate immune suppression. Um, it is rare to see this other than in HIV infection. So for example, if you were working in an urgent care setting and you saw somebody present with shortness of breath and you had a chest x-ray with diffuse infiltrates, you looked in their mouth and saw this, putting two and two together, you could conclude there's a significant likelihood this person has HIV infection. Rarely this has been seen with transplantation patients or other severely immunocompromised patients. But all in all, if you see it, you should really think about HIV infection. The good news is, other than giving people antiretroviral therapy, there is a rare uh, indication to actually need any therapy. So if there, there are some reports in the literature of people having severe oral hairy leukoplakia where they tried drugs like acyclovir and valacyclovir, but I've never seen a case in my experience over the years that actually required um, therapy. These lesions tend to go away after being on antiretroviral therapy for about three to six months. Okay, case number two. This individual presents uh, with a similar type CD4 count, just under 400, around 390. His symptoms that he came in with were severe sort of burning in his mouth that he described every time he drank something like orange juice or ate spicy food. Uh, his mouth felt like it was burning. We are looking at an image of the roof of his mouth. And the other thing that he described was that food just didn't taste very good and it was very bland. And what we're seeing actually here on the roof of his mouth is a lot of redness on the roof of his mouth. That is what is being depicted as abnormal. The sort of normal color pigmentation as you go to the bottom of the slide is more normal. The redness that you're seeing diffusely on the upper palate was abnormal. With that in mind, what would you actually recommend for treating this individual? Would it be A, oral valacyclovir, B, oral doxycycline, C, oral fluconazole, or D, intramuscular penicillin G? Okay, good. We've got most people choosing oral fluconazole. So what this is, is erythematous candidiasis. So erythematous candidiasis can look like several different types of, um, or can have several different types of appearances. 
On the tongue, this can be sort of red, slick spots that you see. On the roof of the mouth, it appears very similar typically to what I showed, which is diffuse erythema on the roof of the mouth. Now, the history, I think, is what everybody clued into. The burning sensation, that's very characteristic for oral candidiasis. The lack of uh, the problems with taste, that's a very characteristic finding that you get with people who have candidiasis. So in the clinic setting, when I hear a patient describing those symptoms, before I even look in their mouth, I, I very strongly suspect that they may have candidiasis. So there's actually several forms of candidiasis that you might see. This one is a much more obvious diagnosis, I think. This is what we call pseudomembranous candidiasis, or the common term you hear people use for this is just thrush. So pseudomembranous candidiasis, erythematous candidiasis, and this is another example of pseudomembranous candidiasis on the, the upper lip area uh, and on the gum line. The third major type of candidiasis that you see is what's called angular chelitis. And people may just describe a sort of a burning or chafing on the corners of their mouth. Um, and when you see this, usually you can manage the angular chelitis with topical therapy as long as they don't have any significant intraoral candidiasis. So the three forms, just to review, pseudomembranous, erythematous. People also synonymously use the term atrophic with the erythematous, and the last is the angular chelitis. Okay, now in terms of therapy for oral candidiasis, the first line therapy recommended in the opportunistic infection guidelines is fluconazole and once daily fluconazole. Uh, alternatives are itraconazole oral solution or posiconazole oral solution. Um, posiconazole is something that it's, uh, we don't tend to have as much historical experience with because I think most of us that have seen a lot of oral candidiasis have used fluconazole predominantly. There are topical therapies that can be used uh, also clotrimazole, myconazole, nystatin. I think uh, most guidelines and most experts have moved more towards just using fluconazole and that's what the OI guidelines now recommend is first-line therapy. It used to be that we were very hesitant to overuse fluconazole or to use it regularly because of the concerns of developing fluconazole resistant candidiasis. This issue has moved more into the background as we see less candidiasis, we see less people needing chronic therapy with fluconazole. So I think the resistance issue has definitely become uh, less, of an, uh, less of a problem. Okay, moving on to case three. So this is an individual that I'm asked to see if people can generate a differential diagnosis of an oral ulceration. So this gentleman actually had a CD4 count that was under 100. The last two had been sort of in the 50 to 60 range and the 70 to 80 range. He was not on antiretroviral therapy. He had recently been diagnosed with HIV. And he comes in and describes this lesion on his lower lip area that he says really over a period of about three to four weeks, maybe even a little longer, has slowly expanded. And without giving you any more history, what I'd like to see, and see if anybody can think of what they would put in the differential diagnosis here of a man who presents with low CD4 count and an oral lesion that looks like this. Okay, so oral syphilis, absolutely. Other, other takers on differential diagnosis. Absolutely, so oral herpes simplex or an adenocarcinoma, so that's three, and I'm only looking for probably one more thing in my mind that I put as a common in the differential. Anybody else wanna take one more? Good, good, so blastomycosis can cause oral lesions and they can cause ulcerations. Histoplasmosis can also cause lesions. The histoplasmosis lesions are usually more ulcerated on the roof of the mouth, but that's great to consider in the differential diagnosis. I didn't give anybody any history to suggest those, uh, and it turns out he didn't have any unusual travel history. So one more of aptus ulcers, perfect, okay. So that's exactly what I was looking for for the differential diagnosis. The point that I would make here is that it is extremely difficult to make this diagnosis without diagnostic tests. So when you just see an ulceration like this, there are some clues. If it's not painful, that would make you think a little bit more about syphilis. 
But I'll say that any syphilis lesion that gets that big is probably eventually going to start causing a little bit of pain. So the workup that we did for this individual, we did syphilis antibody testing, which turned out to be negative. We cultured him for oral herpes simplex, and that was negative. His travel history did not suggest any um, outside travel. And so what we ended up doing was treating him, um, oh, I'm sorry, it, so we initially had that, the herpes FA was negative, and five days later, the culture for the herpes test turned out positive. So the initial screening for herpes on the fluorescent antibody was negative, but the culture turned up positive. And this turned out to be a diagnosis of herpes simplex. And, and I really <clears throat> would not have known that just from looking at, at the mouth with, without doing diagnostic tests. So here's just a couple examples of, of oral herpes. I mean, we've all seen herpes on the lips of patients that are immune competent. They tend to be short-lived, three, four, five days of blisters, and then they resolve. But remember that people with advanced HIV infection can get chronic herpes lesions in the mouth, on the skin, uh, especially if they have CD4 counts less than 100. Here's an example of a couple sort of teardrop-shaped lesions that were oral herpes simplex. Uh, an example of sort of a more common extralabial herpes simplex of just a cluster with vesicles and some erythema around it. That's sort of a very classic appearance that you would see. This individual had a little bit higher CD4 count when that slide was taken. Here's a patient that we think had primary herpes simplex. I actually did a herpes antibody test at the time we saw him because there was such a diffuse outbreak of herpes in the lip area involving multiple uh, sort of regions around the mouth and it turned out his HSV antibody was negative, culture was positive for herpes simplex type 1. So I think that was an example of primary herpes simplex which can be more severe in patients. Usually we see recurrent herpes simplex in our patients. So the therapy for herpes simplex is usually uh, either valacyclovir, famcyclovir, or acyclovir, uh, typically five to 10 days. For your individuals who may have recurrent outbreaks of these, uh, you can use chronic suppressive therapy with valacyclovir, famcyclovir, or acyclovir. But unlike immune competent patients, you really shouldn't be using once a day chronic suppressive therapy. The OI guidelines recommend using twice daily suppressive therapy. Okay, case number four. This is, um, an individual who has aptus stomatitis or aptus ulcers, just like was brought up in the differential diagnosis by uh, in the last case, this individual came in and um, had really very severe symptoms that started developing multiple aptus stomatitis lesions uh, in multiple places in the mouth, on the on the basically on the tongue, in the roof of the mouth, in the buccal mucosa, uh, and was really extremely uncomfortable with this. Here's a, here's a, a picture um, of a different patient who had extremely painful aptostomatitis. Again, multiple places in the mouth that really weren't responding to topical anesthetics or topical corticosteroids. And with subsequent multiple episodes, he actually got several courses of oral prednisone. So this is more of an advanced case or in a more unusual case, but I wanted to raise one issue that maybe some of you have not heard about, and that is, how could you possibly manage these patients who have severe aptus stomatitis that are not responding to conventional therapy? So the question I'm asking here is what other systemic therapy is effective in treating severe aptus stomatitis? Would it be A, thalidomide, B, methotrexate, C, hydroxychloroquine, or D, naproxen? All righty, let's see what we got. So, Thalidomide is actually the correct answer. So I would imagine there's somewhat of an age distribution here and that those individuals who've been doing HIV clinical care for a long time remember the days where we actually had to treat these severe aptus lesions with thalidomide. Um, rarely we may see this nowadays, but in general, most patients, if you can get them on antiretroviral therapy, the severity of these aptus lesions uh, are really diminished significantly. But Actually, within the last year, I saw one patient in the clinic that had severe aptus stomatitis where it actually crossed our mind to use thalidomide after he had had several courses of oral prednisone. What you, you, you see is, you know, uh, the, for the distribution here is some suggestions of other sort of immunosuppressant type compounds like methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine. Those theoretically might work, but there isn't the data as there is with thalidomide. Of course, everybody's familiar with thalidomide as a very uh, potentially severe 
uh, side effect with drug that can cause you know defects and and uh, that in and unborn and and with limb defects. Uh, but this has actually been rigorously studied in HIV and published in the New England Journal years ago. And actually, thalidomide was compared with placebo in approximately almost 60 patients. And individuals enrolled in the study had to have an aptus lesion that was at least 5 millimeters. And they gave daily thalidomide, and they showed a very clear benefit over placebo in people. So it has been well studied. It is a protocol you have to go through. Um, to actually get the lidamide and be able to administer it for patients to make sure that you're not administering this drug to somebody who potentially could get pregnant or that they're not getting the drug exposed to a partner of theirs that could potentially get pregnant as well too. So in terms of just in general with aptus stomatitis lesions, uh, we don't know what causes them. Nobody knows what causes them. Topical anesthetics can relieve the symptoms. Topical coating agents can also provide some relief. What I usually start with and what most guidelines recommend is a topical corticosteroid that's mixed in with a dental paste like Orobase, and you can apply this to the lesions. But more severe lesions, especially in the back of the throat and on the buccal mucosa, may require systemic therapy. And really the only two systemic agents that have been shown to be effective are prednisone and thalidomide. So the last case to wrap this up, I'm going to show you four or so clinical images and see if you can then conclude what all of these patients share in common as the same diagnosis. So this is an individual that has this, it's a nodular lesion on the upper gum area that's this reddish lesion that you're looking at here. Here's a different patient that has somewhat similar, a little bit different colored lesion, nodular again, lower part of the mouth. Third patient that has this lesion, that initially I had no idea what it was, but biopsy was proven. And then the fourth lesion is here. What is the most likely diagnosis in these? Okay, what do you think? Oral squamous cell cancer, bacillary angiotomas, angiomatosis, Kaposi sarcoma, or pigmented viral warts. So this is going to be Kaposi <laughs> sarcoma. So a couple points about oral Kaposi sarcoma. Most of you have probably seen significant number of cases of cutaneous um, Kaposi sarcoma. But in terms of oral, uh, it's a subtle diagnosis and sometimes people come in with just a hyperpigmented area. The place that I find it most difficult are with very dark pigmented skin uh, individuals, sometimes there's natural pigmentation on the roof of the mouth that can, can, I think, make it difficult to distinguish from Kaposi sarcoma. But what you're really looking for is altered pigmentation with a nodular type appearance to it. The cause of this is human herpes virus type 8 definitely indicates some significant immune suppression. It is an age-defining condition. And another point is if you see oral lesions, you probably really want to at least ask about or investigate for systemic Kaposi sarcoma. For example, the place that is most concerning is pulmonary Kaposi's or gastrointestinal Kaposi's. Antiretroviral therapy has really become a critical component of managing everybody with Kaposi sarcoma. Local therapies can be used, and, and clearly there's systemic um, a cytotoxic chemotherapy such as liposomal adriamycin, doxorubicin, that can be used in severe cases. So why don't I stop there and see if there's a few questions. Thank you all for participating.